Saga Cigars, makers of the Saga Golden Age. The Golden Age is a cigar that takes you back to the classic days of cigar smoking. Through the six generations of experience by the Reyes family, Saga Golden Age delivers a timeless blend that uses the nobility of the tobacco to bring you the perfect balance of power and flavor. It narrates better than words the history of a family's tradition in tobacco, delivering a cigar much like the ones they used to smoke in the times of Hemingway. Saga Golden Age is a full-bodied, full-flavored Dominican Puro. With tobaccos from one farm, the blend features a Corojo 2006 wrapper and filler from original Cuban seeds grown in the Dominican Republic. Available in four sizes at an affordable price, the Saga Golden Age is sure to please and take you back on a journey to yesteryear. Rocky Patel Premium Cigars, the Tabaquero, developed and blended by Cuban master of tobacco, Hamlet Paredes. This cigar is an exciting addition to the Patel family, featuring traditional and rare sizes, hand-picked by Hamlet himself. Smoke Hamlet Paredes today. For more information, visit them on the web at rockypatel.com, and be sure to follow Rocky Patel Premium Cigars on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. on something, we don't want there to be any guesswork. We believe the information must be accurate, and it has to be reliable. For what we review, the goal is hopefully to educate our audience, and at the same time, an equally important goal is in turn to get educated ourselves. What we want to do is earn the trust of our audience, and to do that, we ensure what we report is accurate, rumor-free, and teaser-free. The premium cigar industry is so dynamic, and every day brings something new. We wanted Cigar Coop to be an extension of that experience, so it has to be 365 days a year. We wanted to create a true media ecosystem and integrate Cigar Coop with the power of our Stogie Geeks programming network. Welcome, everybody, to a very, very special Stogie Geeks episode. We're here in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Palm Steakhouse um, with George Padron uh, for a very special uh, event here. George, thanks for making the time to come here tonight. It's my pleasure. My pleasure to be here with you. We really appreciate it. George, it's been a real exciting... I, you were here two years ago, and the last two years, there's just been a lot of excitement, I think, around Padron with, with a lot of the things you've been doing, as well as just maintaining some of the best cigars out there. Um, tonight, I know one of the cigars we're talking about is um, the Padron 1926 90th. Um, very different Padron cigar than we've seen in the past, in that, um, from a packaging standpoint, and even from a Vitola standpoint. Why don't you talk a little about that project? Well, the, the 90th uh, was a, a product that we introduced to celebrate my father's 90th birthday. Um, while it may look a little bit different, it's a similar blend to the 1926. Um, you know, the product is, uh, is unique in, in many respects. It's round, it comes in a tube, which are new things for us. But, um, you know, I, I think we're very proud of the fact that it's a product that is honoring my, father's, my father and his, his, 90th, his 90 years of being you know, alive and in the cigar business and all the things that he's done for, for all of us. That, that was uh, not a box press either. That was uh, round. Can you explain Was that uh, what was behind that? Uh, nothing. It was just uh, we decided to make a round. <laughs> I mean, okay. really not, not that complicated of an idea. Just, you know, we decided to change and go back to, to a round format for just for this specific cigar. Okay. What were some of the things in terms of going to a round format that were maybe a little different? Because Padron's known a lot for their box press cigars, I mean, throughout the years. What were some of the things that maybe were a little different with, with going with a round cigar? You know, honestly, not much. The cigar is round. All of our cigars are round. They're, they're squared after they're made. So, I mean, I have smoked every single cigar that we make round, and there's no difference. So... You know, for us, it wasn't a big deal. I know that for the consumers, it's something new, but it's really the same cigar that we make in the, that, that comes out square. But this one's round. Now, I actually have so. seen a round cigar that you guys did once before. It was a nineteen. It was the nineteen sixty four anniversary for Drapers as well. So you guys have done that in the past. Yeah, yeah, we've we've done it. Sure. Yeah. You know, when we've been asked, you know, for special for good friends like the guys at Drapers, uh, you know, we certainly obliged to that, and we were happy to do it. 
So yeah, I smoked the cigar before we got here uh, when I was over at Tinderbox in the Natural. I loved it. Um, it was everything Padron um, and more. I mean, it had a, it was a very smooth cigar, and it had all those great qualities that I enjoy in the 1926 series. Yeah, it's uh, you know we're very proud of it. It it took a while to to come up with the blend, but uh, you know in honoring the 1926 blend, which is a blend that we have done for my father's uh, birth year, uh, that's why it, it is a 1926 series. And anything special about putting the two bows on? Uh, no, uh, just uh, we had we didn't have a tubo in, in our line, and it was something that we felt would be nice to have. You know, for for many customers, they prefer tools, so uh, that was really just the idea behind it. Uh, appreciate the information on on the round cigar. You smoked them all round, so not a big deal for you. But there is something that is a little different. It's this cigar right here. Uh, this is a, a really nice cigar, in my opinion. Tell me a little bit about what made you want to go towards a, a lighter Connecticut shade in the Damaso. Well, uh, you know, our our brand is has traditionally been known as a brand that makes uh, medium to full-bodied cigars. Um, you know, for us, it's important, and for me, who I am developing a brand and a portfolio of products, I want to have a portfolio of products that, that appeal to many different types of customers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are many consumers that enjoy medium to full body cigars, but there are also many that enjoy a little bit milder profile cigars. So we didn't have anything like that in our, in our portfolio, and I felt that it was important to have it. So, you know, this is sort of our, um, our uh, product to, to meet that demand. Excellent. You know? I know here in Charlotte, at the Tinderbox here with Craig Cass, I know that the, the, the members and people that come into the store have gravitated towards it. It's selling very, very well. What's been the, um, fr from your perspective across the country, what's been the reception on the new cigar? Uh, well, the, the product has done well. It's, uh, you know, launching a new product like this is is uh, is always, you know, it's in, it could be challenging at times, okay. uh, you know, in terms of the national market. This is not the typical product that our consumers would smoke. Right, right. So, so, you know, it's a, it's a new thing for us. The product, like I said, it has done well, but, uh, you know, it's a, this thing takes time. It takes time to build brands, and it takes time to build products, you know, to the level that we've achieved. Now, remember, we have been at this for 52 years. So Padron is where it is today be because of the time that we've put into this. Uh, this br product, even though it's a Padron, it's a little bit different. So the typical Padron customer is not the customer that's going to smoke the cigar. In most cases. In right. some cases, it could be. Yeah. There could be morning many, coffee. exactly, there could be some consumers that prefer milder cigars in the morning and then, you know, more fuller bodied cigars as the day goes on. We didn't have a product for that consumer. So that consumer was going elsewhere. Now we have a product that they can smoke under the Padron name. Got it. Thank you. And really, did when you, when you did a Connecticut Shade Cigar, this is really the first one I'd say that you've done. What are challenges in terms of working with a Connecticut Shade wrapper? Did you guys find that, or was it something that came really naturally to you guys? At least you do great cigars over the years. Uh, you know, the, the working with a Connecticut Shade wrapper has is a, is, a, is different than working with the types of wrappers that we use. Uh, but you know, we adapt to it, and you know, it's not that complicated. You know, after you know, we've been at this for a quite a while, so right. so that we figured it out quickly. But um, you know, it's it's a much more delicate wrapper to, to work with. That's for sure. Yeah. So. And you came out with. A couple of line extensions at this year's trade show with a slightly different blend of, of the Damaso, right? Kind of a modified blend of that? Yes, we did. We came out with a 32 and the 34. Now, these are both under the red label, the Damaso red label. These cigars, uh, unlike the original release of the Damaso, which were more milder cigars, th these cigars tend to be a little bit more between mild and medium, so a little bit heavier than the original release. So, again, just something for people to taste and determine what, what they prefer. Another thing you did interesting, I noticed, was um, obviously this was a, a round release as well, but you also put cello around that cigar. Was that the first time you guys have opted to use cellophane? Uh, well, uh, no. Other we use it. Yeah, we have the traditional, the Padron Classic line that's okay. also. That's right. This cigar, the Damaso, being a cigar that is a Connecticut shade, it's more delicate. I think it was important to have it in a, you know, with a, with a cellophane wrapper to protect the cigar. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I actually, this is my first time smoking the Red Label, and I do get a little more of that oomph with it. Good. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. Yeah. Good. 
Um, a couple other. Remember, that it's important to remember that all of the tobacco inside of that cigar is all Nicaraguan, sun-grown Habano. That's our the same types of fillers that we use on other cigars. So just blend it a little bit differently. Did not know that. Yeah. There, I mean, when I smoked this, the Damasoline and this, I mean, it's it's Padron. I mean, there's 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 an intangible Padron quality I get from this cigar. It's different. You're right. It's in it, but it's going to reach out to that audience. You know, most most smokers are milder smokers. So this really is a great opportunity for exactly. Padron here for you guys to capitalize on. Yeah, I mean, it's important for the retailers. You know, many of the consumers that walk into retail shops are looking for mild cigars. So just to think of it in terms of the numbers, let's say you have 10 customers that walk into a retail shop, six, five or six may be asking for mild cigars. We didn't have any cigars in that category, so we're immediately, immediately excluded from those six customers that have yep. walked in the door. They, the retailer did not have a Padron product to offer them in that category, so now we do. How about your dad? Is he happy with the project as well? It seems like you're very my happy with it. My dad's always happy. <laughs> my dad's always happy. He's got a lot of things to be grateful for, you know, so he's, he's a very positive man, and he, he's worked his ass off to get to where we are today, and he's got to be happy. <laughs> you know, when you, when you think about, you know, 90 years old, I, you know, that's a great milestone. 50 years as a company is... 52 now. 52 now. Okay, 52 now. That's amazing. I mean, that's just an accomplishment in any industry. You guys should be really proud of I mean, obviously you are, but this is, that's, you know, so that's great. Um, a couple other cigars uh, that, that have hit our shelves recently um, is a, a variation on your 64 blend, the, the Hermoso. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about that cigar as well? Uh, the Hermoso is uh, part of the anniversary line. It's the same blend. It's just a shorter cigar. You know, I think that in many cases there are consumers out there that prefer smaller cigars, especially now that coming, winter is coming. People don't have as much time to smoke. This gives them a, a, a great cigar that they can smoke that doesn't require a lot of time. Gives them a lot of flavor, and it still has the you know the anniversary characteristics. Did you have a couple different sizes and shapes of the Hermoso that you tested before yeah, yeah, arriving? Yeah. We, we tested we tested many different sizes in that you know profile of cigar, uh, and we finally settled on that one. So we're very happy with it. Uh, same ring gauge as the 1926 number nine. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah nice cigar. Uh, I, I smoked that quite a bit in the uh, in the uh, Maduro, uh, and you're absolutely right. I walk the dog. It's a perfect cigar. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. And on the other side, with the 1926 line, earlier this year you released the um, the 1926 uh, number 48 TAA, right. which goes the opposite. It goes to a, I should say, opposite. it's a bigger cigar, a 60 ring gauge in the 1926. Yeah, that that was uh, mostly just a, a special project that we did for the TAA members. Uh, you know, as you know, we are part of the TAA, and uh, Tinderbox is also a part of the TAA. Uh, they and on on many you know over the years we have produced special cigars for the TAA members and you know some of you of your audience may not know what the TA is but the TA is the Tobacconist Association of America it's comprised of maybe the top you know 70 80 retailers across the country and uh, you know they have this organization that gets together and you know we're a part of that so it's uh, it's a great limited thing. size limited shape specifically yeah, for the TA yeah, right yeah, yeah we do that Thanks. so yeah I know there's a couple of them that you've done um, the Bellicoso in the 1964 and the number 47 which when I was at the trade show, I saw now they're going to be a part of your regular portfolio. Right. Th those cigars were originally uh, limited edition cigars produced for the, for the TAA. Yes. Now we have incorporated them to, into our regular offering, product offering. The um, On the 47, uh, just personally for me, I'm a big fan of the Exclusivo, so when you did the 1926 and the Exclusivo size, that is a killer cigar. Fantastic cigar. <laughs> both in the Natural and in the Maduro, offering something different. Just really enjoy both of those. Yeah, it was interesting because the, the Exclusivo is a great cigar. For some reason, the size of that cigar is is a per, it blends. It's the, the flavor of it is very consistent. It's very unique. Yeah. So it was a simple thing for us to, to just make the same blend as a 26, but in that size, and it, I think it worked well. So, you know, just another product for people to have nice. and to taste. Okay. Um, we're going to transition a little bit over to the FDA. Um, and just interested in uh, a, a man of your stature. You guys have been doing this for a number of years. Really curious to see. You've been around the block more than a time or two. So in terms of regulation, we know that the FDA is going to regulate. But from your perspective, um, what are some of the things that you're optimistic about? And then 
the things that you hope maybe this new uh, administration can kind of change a couple of things from from maybe a predicate date or something like that? Just want your take on that, if you could. Well, um, the FDA situation is a very complicated issue. Uh, you know, there's still a lot of information that has not been released as to exactly how we are supposed to comply with the, the regulations that are coming. Right. So, you know, I'm not quite sure the FDA has the capacity to react to the avalanche of stuff that's going to come their way with the cigar war, you know, when once this starts to take its time right. in, in the cigar in the cigar industry, um, you know, there are certainly a lot of things that the new administration can do. Uh, they have repeatedly said that they want to reduce regulations on small on businesses. So, you know, we're hoping that that translates into some sort of relief for our industry, which will greatly suffer from this FDA regulation. You know, the the uh, cigar industry is mostly made up of family businesses. Um, and it's very difficult to compete in an environment when you have these types of regulations. Um, so hopefully, you know, after the new administration comes in, there could be some changes. There could be some a new way to look at these things, and there could be some relief in the form of the, the way that these regulations are implemented. So I don't know. We'll see. Someone in the industry told me that, you know, obviously they can... They can take on regulation, but it's the cost of the regulation. Is it? Is that something that's on your? Is are the cost of the regulation something that's really paramount on your line right now? Well, there's no doubt about it. The the cost of the regulation is, in some cases, insurmountable. I mean, right. it, you you just don't know. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, that uh, you know will make it very difficult for small companies to 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 comply and to exist. Um, you know, another thing that I that I that I think will also not be a good thing for the industry is that it, it creates barriers to entry. It doesn't allow for companies to get into the business. It also doesn't allow for companies to develop new products, which is a big part of what this industry is all about. Our in, our company in particular is not a company that introduces a lot of new products. Uh, traditionally, we have not done that, but we do like to do it on special occasions to commemorate special events in our company. Company's history, so we're not immune from that either. I mean, even though, we, like I said, we don't do new productions and new releases every single year, we do like to do it every once in a while. That's something that will be eliminated from now on. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of changes, and uh, you know how we adapt. You know, I can tell you one thing: as far as Padron is concerned, we will fight to the end. Okay, we're going to protect what we have as much as we can, and we will hopefully be able to continue to do business in some form or fashion. Um, but we'll keep producing the same quality products that we've always produced and hopefully we have enough loyal customers that will continue to support us support us over the next few years See, they're gonna they're asking for, right now the way it stands they're asking for anything to be regulated that wasn't on the shelf since 2007 is there any optimism on your part or do you have any insight into possibly getting that moved up maybe till 2014, 2016? I have no insight on that okay. whatsoever. Okay. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of things that we'd love to happen, but we don't know what could happen there. So okay. it would be a total speculation, you know, nothing. Now, I heard a really interesting roundtable you did with Cigar Dave. It was a few months ago. One thing that I, I heard talked about was, as far as the approach, it was a legislative approach, a judiciary approach, which I think everyone's familiar with. But there was another approach as far as sitting down directly with the FDA and talking through, as, as crazy as that may sound, but especially now with a new administration, are you guys more optimistic with that? Um, I don't know yet. We don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, you know, we're, at this point, we've tried a lot of different avenues to to try and uh, remedy this situation as much as possible and it's been a, a tough battle uh, you know but we continue to battle and we continue to explore every possibility and obviously you know sitting down in the future with whoever is in charge of the FDA, if there are any changes then that may be a possibility as well I don't know I mean there's still a lot of question marks no, it definitely, definitely. But products such as uh, the Domaso, that's gonna obviously you, you're gonna you're gonna put that into going forward, right? You're yes, gonna, yes, yeah. yes. Absolutely. So that's great news for a lot of Padron fans. Yes. So that's great. 
I want to turn a little bit to Cuba here. Um, I, actually, I, just, I actually had a chance to go to Cuba, um, and obviously it's something that's on a lot of the cigar industry's mind right now. You know, obviously there's been some events with the death of Castro, um, some of the loosening of regulations. What, I just want to get some general thoughts with you on what you've seen happen over the past few months and, you know, what you think about that. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, not much has changed in Cuba with respect to, to our business and our industry. Uh, you know, there's still an embargo. Uh, it's still impossible to go and do any type of business with, with the Cuban government. So, you know, the only thing that we can look forward to is what could happen. What may happen? They could lift the embargo. They, they may open up trade, you know, between the countries. That All of those things could be great things for the cigar industry. Uh, I'm for, I, for one, and our family, we are not concerned with having Cuban products enter the U.S. market. Uh, we look at that as an opportunity for our products to compete on, on the U.S. on U.S. soil. You know, with our distribution channels, with the way that you know we know this market, and the way that the consumers know our products. Okay, which is very important. We have a very a lot of loyal, loyal customers that are co accustomed to smoking quality cigars that are consistent, okay? So I'm very confident that if we continue to do what we do and just focus on our product first and foremost and focus on the quality, the rest will take care of itself. Now, having said that, it also, having the ability to one day possibly go to Cuba and produce cigars in Cuba or have access to Cuban tobacco will also give our family a tremendous opportunity. You know, there is also an opportunity. There is a tremendous opportunity. Many, many people may be afraid of cigars coming in. We're not afraid. We welcome that, and we also welcome the opportunity to go to, to Cuba and have access to Cuban tobacco yeah. and make cigars, you know, under our supervision, yeah. under our specifications, uh, handled by us with a Padron name from Cuba. That I look forward to. That that a lot of people would be excited about that, including yeah, myself. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's a great. Now we would never abandon what we have in Nicaragua. Okay, what we have it's will working. is yeah, working absolutely. and will continue to, to go on forever. Now, the other things that could happen, those are add-ons, things that we could add to our line, to our portfolio. Having a product from Cuba would be a tremendous add-on addition to our lines of cigars. You know, we'll see how this all plays out with FDA, with the embargo. I mean, there's a lot of things still left to be decided, but I mean, there's a lot of opportunity, possibly. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, I have a question that has nothing to do with you know, Cuba. Um, I'm just curious, on a personal level, so many cigars coming out of your factory. What is your top go-to, your number one, your number two cigar? What, what are you gravitating to on a daily basis? Imagine, that's, I, I have so many cigars that I can smoke. Um, you know, on a daily basis is a different question than like on a special, special occasion. Because, you know, during the day, you know, we're working, we're, you know, constantly on the move. So there's not a lot of time to sit down and smoke a, a certain type of cigar. Right. Um, you know, also depends on where I'm at. If I'm in Nicaragua, you know, I'm testing and tasting a lot of cigars that maybe not be the standard products that we're putting out. But, you know, I smoke only Padron. And I love doing it. We have a lot of options. And, you know, I, I would say I smoke a lot of 64s and family reserve. I mean, I stick to, to the more heavier cigars, you know, yeah. but not very big cigars, more, in, you know, 50 ring gauge, 52. Those are the types of cigars that I smoke. No, yeah, I mean, and I, so when you have a bunch of those uh, 50th anniversary, you don't go grabbing a few of those and just... Of course I do. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know I I'd would. Be foolish not to. <laughs> yeah. One of the greatest cigars uh, ever made, by the way, both that Maduro and the natural. Thank you. Me and my partner, we argue in terms of, uh, he likes the uh, natural, I like the Maduro, but we win either way is what we look at. Good. Yeah, absolutely. Good. As long as you're smoking a Padron, we're happy. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Anything else? No. George, I want to thank you very much. I know uh, it's going to be a busy night. We appreciate the time as always. Best of luck to you, um, right. and I look forward to seeing you soon again. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Pleasure. Okay. Welcome back to the Stogie Geek Show, episode 215. Um, you know, stage first, thanks Thanks a lot for being here tonight, um, and thanks for participating in, in the George Padron interview. I had a great time. It was a great event. They did a really nice job running out the palm there, uh, one of our top 
uh, restaurants here in town, right. and uh, it's always a nice thing. We get we get George every second year, right? And uh, it was a really nice event. So thanks for the invite. I appreciate, no, appreciate it. it. Thanks, you know, thanks to Craig Cass of the Tinderbox, who, you know, this is the second time we've had to interview uh, George Padron. You know, Stogie Eats is still a small media outlet, and uh, you know, George does not do a lot of interviews. Fortunate to get that opportunity to do that, you know, so it's one of the few podcasts. I know some, there's been some big podcasts, obviously, he's been on, too, but I still look at us as a boutique media brand, and, and he did take the time to do that uh, interview. You know, I almost, when I listened to it the second time, it didn't quite sound as bad, but he definitely, the beginning of that interview, when we were talking about the rounded cigars, it struck, there was no doubt that struck a nerve with him. The, the body language, uh, the eyes. The body language the, is, was the key yeah, thing, yeah. The, 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 the eyes, I mean, focused right in, uh, looked right at the eye when, when answered. Yeah, I, I got that sense as well. Right. Um, and like you, I walked away feeling like we struck a nerve, but I don't know that it translated on the uh, video. On the video. Yeah, I mean, you and I afterwards just said, what did, you know, but when I watched it again, I'm like, it didn't, it didn't seem, but I think if you were, sometimes this is when you're actually doing it in person, the interview. And I don't think George held held it against us, obviously. I think the interview flowed pretty well after that. Yeah. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, I mean, and I wondered why it was it, a, and I don't know, I wanted to kind of ask him that afterwards. Was it an issue of maybe he was asked a question a hundred times, or was it more maybe what he said is it's not a big deal for us what we did this? Well, I mean, one of the things that I didn't think about, right, and he was exactly right, Every they don't make square cigars. Every cigar is round. They're smoking them. They're yep. testing them, right? And it's not until after they're made that they're put in the presses to become square. So I totally get that. However, um, I, I wish I would have had a follow-up question because in my mind, Will, and you and I have talked about this before, those round cigars have got less filler in them than other round cigars from other manufacturers. And if you're going to pack a round cigar to the capacity of a normal round cigar— you can't box press it. You have to have less filler in there so that it can be boxed. And so in my mind, I'm not in the factory, but in my mind, I just, I feel that, and I'll use the 90th as an example, the flavor on the natural is amazing, but it's a little too effortless on the draw from my personal liking. It's, a, it's not a, it's not a, yeah, it's, the combustion's fine. Yes. But it's a loose, it's a very airy, open, it's a very open draw. Well, and for a Toro, it smokes very fast. It, it absolutely right? does, yeah. So, so in my mind, again, and for me personally, I would have expected to have a little more filler in there so that the Toro lasts the length absolutely. of the Toro. Absolutely. Um, but again, that's just me, you know, wanting the world according to me, right? Um the cigar is phenomenal. It stands on its own. It'll it'll be a very good cigar. I'm sure it'll age well. But I want my round cigars to have a little more filler and to last a little longer. It was just too airy for me. Yeah, I think we talked. And again, it's not to knock the cigar uh, because in the end, the the only negative I saw with it was it just smoked faster. Yeah, I didn't have combustion issues with it at nope, all. I didn't either. If burn issue was great. Right. Flavor was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the bird was really even. I mean, I didn't see any construction issues there. No. It was just very loose. That was my only comment. Right. And right. so um, I guess – and you know what? To be honest with you, when the Damaso White first came out back in the summer, um, I don't know if that's when they were released, but that's when we got About, in the store. The Damaso uh, White came out last summer. Yeah. So when it was uh, around May, June, when they came out, um, I said the same thing. I said, these these are too loose. Um you know, they're used to making box press, and there's not enough filler in there. That was my own opinion, um, and I just felt that that was the same thing here. Yeah, I, um, you know, that's that's a fair point. You know, so you, the other thing that I took away was when we got into the Damaso conversation. And, you know, I think I've listened to a few interviews with George in the last year, and I almost think he's been a little bit on the defensive about Damaso. Um, that's just kind of the way I'm seeing it, where I think he's been under, I think there's been some criticism with that cigar. Um, and it was, I saw, we, I don't think we criticized him in there. I think we were very, right. but I think there was a point where he mentioned about launching a brand 
and how difficult it is to launch a brand you yep. know, in that interview. No, and, and I agree. And I, I think everything he said made sense to me, right? When D- Damaso White came out, people were like, whoa, this isn't even like a Padron, way too mild, right? And I think that because of that, they came out with Damaso Red, right? They came out with the red with a little more right. umph to it. A little more um, both very good cigars. One's a little more strength and flavor and body from the other. But, you know, maybe there was maybe there was pushback across the country that, you know, Padron folks were not expecting it to be that light. Who knows? You know, could it be? Yeah, so you could look at it is originally when Damaso came out, they were targeting a segment of the market. But in that process, I think it's very possible that they ignored their core strength of the market. You know, does that make sense? It does, because the person who's, like he said in the interview, the person that smokes Padron, they don't smoke mild cigars, right? right? The mildest Padron outside of Damaso is medium plus, right? Yeah. Medium plus to full is, is their in Nicaraguan Puro. That's, right. that's their wheelhouse. So I think their normal audience, it's probably not a smoke for them, unless those folks do smoke other things in the morning. But I think with Damaso is that they're going after a different niche market. They're looking for another consumer base to land on and then maybe transition to the other stuff. Yeah. And, you know, going to that red label, they have the torpedo. Yep. And, and I'll say that the torpedo gives you a little more uh, – it tightens up a little on the draw a bit with yep. that one, yep. which is why I did enjoy the torpedo. It's the 34. I just looked it up. Yeah. He came um, out with the 34 and the 32. Yeah. The 34 and the 32. You know, I've heard some talk that they've re-blended the, other, the white label. I didn't want to ask him that. The only thing that they they have said is that they – I can tell you that the red label definitely smokes different. Yep. And it's definitely, like I mentioned in the interview, it has a little more oomph to it. Yep. Um, and I think it was, an, like I said, I think it was an important step that they took to do that. Um, it makes sense, yeah. right? I mean, it, everything that they do, they're going to they're gonna attack different markets, right? So now they've got a cigar that is a perfect morning smoke with coffee. Yeah. If you are a cigar smoker that smokes in the evening but you don't like full body, Domiso's there for you. So... And, and he's right. It's going to take a while to establish that brand. That brand's probably got a little more uphill battle than, say, the 90th, right? right. Padron 90th, it's already being smoked. And people who smoke it, they're saying it's a home run. They like it. Uh, so flavor is, is there. But uh, Damaso's probably got a little bit of an uphill battle. Yeah. yeah no. I would agree. And, and so he's probably a little cautious and probably a little nervous about that. Right. No, I would definitely I definitely would agree on that. Yeah. Um, we talked about our Marcel. Yeah. So it was interesting – I think we've talked about it on the show a few times, how they kind of launched that out, the uh, the different size. They, they did some test marketing with that in terms of different sizes. Different sizes, different shapes, all the 64, some a little more amped up, hot burn, uh, 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 pepper spice up front. Others a little more dialed back a little bit based on the ring gauge. Uh, I know that it, the Tinderbox, where we got them, we got uh, – we got the, a smaller size. So, it was more along the lines of the 35 and the Principe than what was orig- than what was finally released. The final release was a, a wider, thicker ring gauge, but the ones that we got were actually smaller. And to be honest with you, the Hermoso that is released now is, um, in my mind, I think I like it better. Um, the smaller one had a great pop, right? Like if you smoked the, the Dirty Rat or if you smoked right. uh, some of these other smaller, stronger, you know, uh, right in your face, pepper bombs. Um, the Hermoso was kind of like that. So if you like that, you miss out. But um, I, I think I like the Hermoso where it stands now. Yeah, I think um, I'm in agreement with that as well. Although I did like that 4x50, 52 size that came out. I wonder if we'll see it because, you know, they did get it out before August 8th. They That's, didn't yeah. call it Hermoso. Well, they didn't put Hermoso on the box. No, it wasn't on the box. It wasn't on the box, but I remember – I remember he sends, Stace sends me this, this picture on the phone one night, and he's small. Look what I got. I'm like, what? what is this? I'd never, because you look at that, I had never seen the, the one like that. Right. And then you're saying Hermoso. We, we ended up picking some up. We spoke to them on the show, and we thought they were great. And then when they hit the market, we all start looking at these aren't, these are bigger. Yeah. Well, what's up with this? Yeah. And then Aficionado was reporting it was a 54 at one point. And then it was. It turned out to be. And it turned out everyone was right. They had all these different sizes. Yeah. Out. Now, what I don't know, and I, I wish I could go back and ask a follow-up question. I'd like to know how many different sizes. Right. We got one in in here in Charlotte. 
I'm wondering if they had, you know, four or five, six different sizes that they were trying, or did they just have two, right? I, I don't know, but. I don't know. I, I, from what the way I got it, I, it sounded like there was a, more than two, but I don't think there was like twenty of them either. Right. Yeah. But I got the impression there was more than two, and I don't know exactly how they made the final with, with the feedback. You know, I could see why they went with the fifty-six, the four by fifty-six. Yeah. Because they didn't have an offering in that. No, you're right. They didn't. Now, I was the one I go for four by sixty. But then again, you know, you don't know how that's going to smoke at that point either. Yeah, and George said himself, he typically only smokes 50-52 ring gauges. Right. He doesn't get much right. bigger than that. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, I thought his input on the FDA, uh, his uh, information on Cuba, was, was interesting as well. Um, you know, he, he's got some insight on some things, but he has no idea on others. I, th- I think it's really, the whole FDA thing, as far as I'm concerned, it's a big question mark. I just, I was... I didn't know if maybe because he had been involved with IPCPR, CRA, he's been in Washington lobbying before. I didn't know if maybe there was something that he could dive to us, but pretty much everything he said in the interview was stuff that we had heard. Yeah, before. I didn't get anything. Like I said, it was nothing new I got out of that either. You know, I mentioned the Cigar Dave Roundtable, which, you know, if you hear that, that was something where I got new information out of Um where they talked about the direct negotiation with the FDA. Right. It was the, and here's the thing. I kind of wrote something about this over the weekend. I really think the cigar industry completely blew it. By, by, look, and I don't begrudge Cigar Dave for having a, an exclusive. I, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. But that should have been something live streamed on, on Facebook, yep. like Skip Martin did yep. with the Frank Herrera Q&A. Yep. That, that there was an, you had an opportunity to do something. So I had heard that, for people who haven't heard that, I would encourage them to go check out that Cigar Dave round. It, 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 that's something where I did get something out of that. Yeah. But I don't think they had much more after that because the strategy, you know, I couldn't really, what am I going to I can't ask them legal questions about the lawsuit. Right. Like, I heard that, you know, a couple people said you're going to ask him about the lawsuit. I don't, I don't know how much he's involved. I'm assuming that's being handled by the lawyers right, right. now. Right. I, I think the other thing, too, is, and you asked a good question, right? We're talking about sitting down with Obama or sitting down with President-elect Trump. Right. But sitting down at the table with the FDA, the people who are actually going to be right. enforcing, that makes a lot of sense to me. So what I heard, though, and I was told this from someone very close to the situation. I don't want to diverge a name. But once Trump got elected— the whole game changed. The game plan did change because I imagine now they're going to wait to see. You know, having a having a meeting with the FDA commissioner now is not going to do a lot of good if he's going to be out of a job in three months. No, you're right. You're so, right. So, so now it is going to change. I tell people we'll have someone maybe a little more friendly at the table. Yeah. But you know, they're not. I don't. You know, again, I don't know if they're going to how much they're going to stick their head out on this for us. Um. Good question. Good point. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Now we went to we hit Cuba. Now George's answer with Cuba was I had I had asked him that question two years ago about Cuba, and it was pretty much the same answer: bring on the Cubans. We're, they're ready to take on the Cubans, uh, no fear. Like I think he feels that confident with his product that he can go to war with that product and, yeah. and win. Makes sense. Makes sense. I was just uh, looking at the live feed. Uh, our our buddy Peter uh, he was making a comment during the interview. He said. Um, uh, said, uh, optimism is not a good tact to take at this stage in the game. And I asked him to elaborate because you and I have been talking about that too, right. about, you know, being overly optimistic, uh, when it, it's like a doom and gloom type, type situation. Uh, Peter follows up and says, um, uh, my point on optimism kept the industry from planning for the worst case scenario, which is pretty much what it ended up with. So I guess he's saying, he also says, uh, you know, as an outsider looking in, it seems more like we stuck our heads in the sand, meaning, uh, you know, with what the FDA was doing and we were overly optimistic rather than taking it seriously up front. And seriously up front is not the right word. I'm, I'm not finding the right word. Right. But, you know, uh, attacking it more aggressively sooner as opposed to just maybe all of the, hey, sign this petition. Hey, sign this petition. Petitions aren't getting it done, right? They... Here's the thing. There's going to be another petition with Trump. I'm convinced about it. Right. I'm surprised that there isn't. Right. It has got. They've got to figure a plan out with that next petition. So, 
if it's basically going to be the same people, the people on social media forwarding it saying, sign this petition, I've done my, my due diligence, or me as a CRA ambassador, or you as a CRA yeah. ambassador as well, going, hey, sign this petition, we ain't getting, we ain't going to get to 25000 again. Nope. This has got to be, and, and I, I would say if we're, if we're not going to do this, then maybe don't do the petition. It's got to be ground combat. Yeah. It, we have got to, people have got to go into their stores and get 10 people to physically do it in front of them. That, that is the only way that will have any effect. That's why every petition has failed. And I think we're petitioned, and we talked about it on the show in the past, people are petitioned out. Right. But I do believe, the other thing I keep going back with, with the optimism comment, and I've been accused of being very pessimistic lately, but I can't help it. We have no wins. You know, Donald Trump talks about wins. This industry has zero wins, and I hate saying that. I, right. I know people work so, so hard. I hate saying that, but we have no wins. And that's where I'm kind of like... At this point, I don't really want to hang my hat. I don't want to give my hope. You know, why I was so critical about Giuliani stays is because I don't want to be let down again. I get it. And that's why I don't want to be let down again. I get it. I think George is. I think George is getting to turn it back to him. I think he was. I don't think he tried to paint any sort of a picture there. I think you know he basically said you know Petron's going to be there. We're going to we're going to be standing. You know so. Yeah. So. Getting to twenty five thousand. I mean, I, I don't. Have we even been close to the twenty five thousand? Well, we did get it the first time in two thousand eleven. That was uh, many years ago, right? It was so in two thousand eleven. We we, we have. So we that. did get it. We didn't get it the second time through, and I think I think there were a lot of problems with this with it the second time through. I don't think I think the first time it was much more of a calculated plan right. that was executed. Right. So I think we had a better ground game with that. But the second time through, the petition was thrown out there. There was a rogue petition that was being competed against where someone else put the petition out there. I think that there was such a negative backlash from the industry yep. on their response yep. that people were very disgusted. So I think the, I'm not faulting the petition for being done. I questioned the timing. And the threshold went up to 100000 Right. So right. we have to now look at, and I'm not trying to kind of... Look, I think that Vapes is in this with us as well. Vapes didn't get the 100000 either. I So it, we kind of look at this and we have to say there's got to be a better – We I think the petition needs to be done because that's how you're going to get Donald Trump's attention. Right. But if we're just going to – but the other problem I have with the petitions is there's a lot of ro- – like not just rope, there's a lot of jokes that are out there for petitions. <laughs> no, I mean right. you go you're out right. and we're lumped in with some of these jokes that are out there. Like – and I, you could you could go out there and you could see what I'm talking about, you know. When it was something about a gorilla out there, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, we we need to have things, uh, we need to have things that are basically issues, you know, that the president really needs to address, not not gorillas. I totally agree. So it, I have I think a little bit of that played into it as well, where it's not taken as seriously. Yeah. So yeah, let me ask you a question. Mm-hmm. Retail stores across the country. What do you think? We got five thousand, ten thousand. Let's let's go ten thousand. Okay. But I mean, I, I'll count. So so here's my point. If I if I said that there were five thousand, let's say five thousand. Let's, let's just go five, well. let's five thousand. Five thousand legitimate retailers across the country. Mm-hmm. You're only asking them to get twenty five people each to get to one hundred twenty five thousand. Well, hundred thousand. So, yeah. So so getting to that hundred thousand mark, it should not be an issue. I mean, yeah. if the, now. I will admit that I don't think every retailer is tied in with CRA, so there are some that are probably rogue. But, but you know, in my mind, we should be able to hit that number easily every single time. But but yet we don't. We don't. And here's where I'm going to – and I'll put some of it – look, it's a shared responsibility between the retailer, the consumer, and the manufacturers. Yep. I've seen very few cigar reps – Having people sign the petition. Yeah, I've seen, and and right now these regulations affect their jobs as well as the retail jobs. It, like I said, it affects everybody. I'm not saying it doesn't. Right. But I, I almost feel like the people who are working in the manufacturing sector use. Oh, we put it on Facebook. It's good enough. Yeah, it's, it's not. not have you gotten no. ten people? Like, I tell you what. If I was an owner of a company, I'd have a quota with that petition. When yep. it's out there. If you don't meet quota, I'm sorry. 
You may it's going to be like you don't meet your sales. Yeah, well, well, let's look at it. If if there are five thousand retail stores, right, and if people are listening, mm-hmm. right, this this is the the push, right. When the petition comes out, right, we're asking all five thousand stores to get twenty signatures each, right. To me, that seems to be a very doable goal. If every single store gets twenty people to sign a petition, you're at the hundred thousand mark. Yeah. Easy. It literally has to be. You're up at the register, and that person's got to submit it right there. Yeah. I, I, I don't I, – or fill out a piece of paper and, and deliver it. I don't see any other way. I, I almost would say don't put the petition on Facebook. Right. I, I almost think that's doing more harm at this point. Yeah, so, I don't know. I'm, I'm a mixed bag on but that. I, but I do believe there will be a petition because that's the way it's going to get to the president's attention. Right. They have to kind of show that, and we have to kind of show – we're going to get a lot higher. Than it. We have to get to 100,000. Yep. 99,000 will not cut it. Right. If we're serious, yeah. and is the industry willing to make the investment that's going to take? I, I don't think so. I don't think they are. Yeah. I hate to say it. I'm willing to kind of do my part on it. I think you are, but yep. we need a lot more than just us. No, totally agree with yeah. that. That's, that's the call to arms there. Yeah. Back on Padron, though, um, I, I'm, I'm excited to see what they're going to do for 2017. Okay, so there's one thing that I've seen floating around. It's a stealth product. So JR Cigars, and I'm going to say because it it's on their website. Yeah, it's on the website. JR Cigars has listed, and I've gotten confirmation this is a legitimate product. It's not a mistake. Family Reserve. Family Reserve number 47. Not the year that they skipped and went to 85th. The year they skipped and went to 85. Yeah. That was the that was supposed to be the 2011 release. From what it was listed on the web page, it looked like it was slightly, it was the same, it was a slightly different length. I don't remember if it was shorter or longer. Right, but, but still it was, in the 10 count family reserve boxes. Yeah. Okay. So, but I think it was a little shorter than the 85. Okay. So that's that was interesting. Let me ask a question here. What's the point in waiting with that? Why not just say it's out now? I mean, I understand even if you can't meet production yet. Right. Why would you wait? To why would you wait? Let's say let's we're putting an assumption that it, it, they're going to market it at some point. Right. What is it? I have not seen any advantage to waiting to put this out yet. The yeah. only thing that I could see, uh-huh. and it's all you know, putting my marketing uh-huh. hat on is. You want everybody to jump on the 90th because that's what you geared towards. Oh, I get it. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking family reserve, 90th versus family reserve, 47th. I, I can, I mean, it's another product, but, you know, does it really compete? I don't know. It's a 64 versus a 26. I, I they get, put out the TAAs anyway, so they're competing anyway. They're so competing. I, I don't know. So that's the only thing that makes sense is, is that they maybe don't do it yeah. to compete with the so, 90th. Maybe so, the forty seventh will come out next year. Or this so, yeah, but I'm saying if they wait till the show, then that window they have to, oh, yeah, it has yeah, to get yeah. registered yeah. shorter. And they're gonna but, be looking at the ninety first or whatever they're gonna be calling the next Yeah, year. so I think obviously this 61st. is something I would look for because if you go to jrcigar.com, you you go to the padrone page, it's there. I I spoke to someone in J and R who confirmed I have not gone to the store and looked at it, but I did confirm it is a separate product and the only thing I could put it is, is a I know you don't like the word stealth, but it's it's a it's one of those products that have not been, you know, marketed yet. Yeah. No. I, I so get I think it. we're gonna see. I think we're gonna see that those by the summer. Okay. You know, I think I think they'll still do something with Damaso, and I think probably this year's TAA cigars will will uh, the forty, the TAA forty eights and the twenty six line, which are the six by sixties. Yeah. They'll probably come into the line. Okay. Uh, that would be my next game. I wonder if they push uh, Domiso into the uh, TAA so that they get a Padron TAA Connecticut. My sources have told me that there will be a TAA series this year. Yeah. That they were able to get some introduced to the market in anticipation to okay. this. Good. So they have some additional. My sources do tell me there is, a, whether it's a different Padron, whether it even is a Padron, I don't know. Right. But there will be TAA. There will be TAA. You just don't know right. who are the players. Right. Are. I, but I have been told that there will be TAA cigars Got it. for 2017. So let me just ask you a question now there. Of the TAA blends, if there's a TAA for 2017, like you're saying your sources tell you, who are some of the manufacturers that you hope 
put out another one. Because let's be honest, there are some TAA blends that are amazing, and then there are some TAA blends that are just, in my opinion, they just didn't cut the mustard. There's too many of them, right? There's too many of them, and they don't want to mark the, the TAA doesn't want to market them. Yep. But, you know, I can live if there wasn't a Tatawahe one. They're great cigars, but, you know, I don't know. You know, you know, there's been one every year. I would really like to see, based on, based on this year, I think what LaFleur has done in the last couple of years, with, with they've gotten a little creative with some of the blends have been different. Yeah. Uh, the they came out with a boat. They've done a boat. Yeah. They've done the, the event only one. I want to see, and LaFleur has just been, we use the word agile. They have been, they're thinking out of the box. I think they're using the TAA series. I want to see what they can do right now. I'm a big fan of, of what they've done the past couple of years. Right. But uh, in terms of Tatuaje, I loved what they did in 2015. That was the best. That was, that was one of the all-time epic TAA cigars. It cigar. was great. So um, I, I, I'd like to and see Pete them. doesn't need to market that cigar. It markets itself. I, I totally agree. Right. And the 16s are selling well, but it's, it's a little thinner ring gauge. Um, I don't know. At least in my store, it's not selling as well as the 15s. Right. Uh, I think people prefer a little bit larger ring gauge than the smaller ones. Um, so I'm hoping that, that Tatuaje does have one. Now, if there's a brand that's not done a TAA cigar that you want to see do a TAA cigar. And for folks who don't know, TAA is Tobacconist Association of America. They're like the they're like a group of 80 retailers that are kind of more of the prominent ones. And every year they do a exclusive line of cigars. Yep. Um, is, there a, is there a manufacturer that has not done a TAA cigar that, um, has, that you'd like to see do one? Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> and he had one carved out, but he decided to forego, and he's pushing it across with the Moisture de Saka. But that's one. Um, I'd like to see Roma Craft come in with a TAA. Do you think, do you think they would? It's a small. Uh, you're you, know, asking, they, you know what's funny? That they, wasn't they, your question. Your thing, question though, was they, what I would like. They did crown heads. Why not Roma Craft? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Why, why, why not? You exactly. know, Skip takes one of the lines that he's had. It's, yep. Come out with a new size, new shape, and, and yeah. knock it out. So you asked what I would like. That's what I would like. Um, uh, my father's already done a couple. Uh, Davidoff hasn't done a TAA. I'd like to see a Davidoff. They TAA. did a Avo did a couple. Uh, uh, yeah, but that's under the Avo line. A little different. Yeah, so uh, Avo did a couple. Yeah, da- I would like to see a Davidoff on there. Um, the one I would probably, I know he's done one technically already for Crown Heads, but I'd like to see E.P. Carrillo. Yeah, no, that'd be rock solid. I, I think that would be really, really good. Dad. Yeah, and he just coming off of the CA list, right, top ten. I mean, that that, that would make yep. sense. Yep. That would be a good one I'd like to see yep. as well. Yep. yep. So I think we're hitting the limit here. So. Yep. Uh, thanks again, Stace, for joining. Yeah, um, I had a lot of fun. A lot of thanks. I enjoyed it. Will, thank you, yep. and uh, enjoyed hanging out so with you guys. So, a couple of uh, a couple of programming notes for the next couple weeks. Um, next week, we have Danny Vasquez of Baracoa Cigar Company as our guest. That's on the 9th of January. The sixteenth of January, we have uh, Mel Shaw from M Bombay. Nice. And uh, the 23rd, we have Robert Holt from Southern Drawer Cigars. Uh, Cigar Coop, a lot of people asking me, when is the number one cigar of the year going to be unveiled on Cigar Coop? It will be on Tuesday, January 17th. So we're doing it a little later this year. Um, so, But that will be the final date. We're doing a few things different scheduling-wise on Cigar Coop. So uh, we're going to change things up a little bit this year. But, yep, uh, but we will be going to uh, 10 through 6 this week. Uh, five to three next week, and then the number two and number one on the seventeenth. Look forward to looking forward. Yep. To it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we will. Sh- I think I will shock the world with the number one and number two will be this year. Yeah. Um. But anyway, thanks to everybody. Thanks to Mark, Riley, Tyler up at the uh, Villager North America Studios in Rhode Island. Uh, we'll see everybody next week on the Stogie Geek Show. Mm-hmm.